Well, thank you, T-shirt, and thank you, one and all, for being here today. Uh, I've been to a lot of pro-life rallies. This would be one of the bigger ones for sure, and yet it's in one of... So well done, and yet it's in one of the smaller cities in this country. Um, So well done for that. But as I've been to many rallies, it turns out that I've developed a favourite slogan. And I'm so glad it's on the armbands today, because my favourite pro-life slogan is love them both. And it's, it's my favourite because it's true. There is a better way. There is a way to love them both. But also, it's my favourite because it tells us about what we ought to be doing and what we are doing. And I want to affirm something today, and it is that we are here for love. That is why we are here. And I want to understand, what is love? What does that slogan really mean? You know, Jesus defined love. And he defined it with a story, as he so often does. And he used the story of the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan was a man who took a risk. He was a man who spent his own money. He was a man who used up his own time. He was a man who got down on his knees in the dust. And he was a man who followed up. And he was a man who spent from himself, person to person. And we learn from that story that to love is first to act Without without action, love is nothing. We learn that it is secondly to act at cost to ourselves. And we learn that it is thirdly not just to act at cost to ourselves, but in the highest and the true interests of others. That was the Good Samaritan. He acted. It was costly action. And it was in the highest and true interests of somebody else. I want to say this concerning that matter of action. Look around you. This is a movement of people who are taking action. And we do and we must continue to do so. We must speak up. We must rally. We must be politically motivated. We must respond to opportunities to do things. We must appeal to our neighbours. We must volunteer and give to charities, some of whom will be represented here today who are in the pro-life space. And we must, most importantly, be pro-life examples. We must walk the talk. We must live lives that are testimonies to what we believe. That is action and we must act and we do act. But concerning the matter of cost, I want to make this point. It will cost to do this. It will cost you time. It will cost you money. It will cost you convenience. It will cost you emotionally to care about these things. Believe me. And it will, in some cases, cost you your reputation. And that is why I want to say thank you, especially to the politicians who are here today, because they do it at cost. I want to make this clear point as well. It's not merely action at cost, but it truly is in the service of others. It truly is out of love for others, because these things are not for ourselves. If they were for ourselves, we'd be doing something else with our time. These things are for others. They are for the women who we see in our mind's eye who need a better way. They are for the men who we see in our mind's eye who need to stand up and be men. They are for the children we see in our mind's eye who die. And they die terrible deaths when they have done neither right nor wrong, when they are innocent. We say, love them both. And when we do, we speak in the highest and best interests of others. And so let's say again together, love them both. We've got a very excited group down here. We'll have more of this, don't worry. Um, The pro-choice mindset speaks very differently. Do you know, I have found more and more that the final retreat of pro-choice thinking comes down to a single word, or two words that mean the same thing. The first one is choice, pro-choice. The second one is autonomy. And choice, we are told, is what's best. That's where empowerment can be found, in the autonomy to choose to end a life. That is a lie. It is a diabolical lie which is circulating among us that the best thing we can do in this life is serve ourselves. And we see where it leads when people are lied to like this, when a woman is lied to like this, she terminates a life that needed her. The life that she was created to love and nurture from the very beginning, because from the beginning she was called mother in creation. 
It terminates a life that He was made to protect and guard from the very beginning because from the beginning in creation, He was called keeper, which also means protector. This is the evil reverse image of love. The love of Christ, the love of the Good Samaritan that was perfected in Christ says, I will die for you. Choice, autonomy, abortion, they say, you will die for me. That word autonomy is a wicked lie. It kills, it destroys, and it immiserates because we are not autonomous anyway. It's a lie, it's not true. Our very breath is in the hand of God. But also we are called not to be those who live for ourselves, but those who live for others. And so we stand here today in the full confidence that there is a better way and that by being here, we are doing what we are called to do, which is we love them both. You know, the cost of autonomy, that lie, is almost unthinkable. I sat down recently and had dinner with a federal politician and they showed me some research that was commissioned by the parliamentary library. And the question they asked the library was, how many children are born alive and left to die as a result of failed abortion in the nation of Australia? Only some states keep that data. And yet over the last 10 years, I was staggered to find that there are hundreds and hundreds of known cases of that very thing taking place. And we know that when abortion to birth is legislated, that practice only increases. And they can dress that up in buzzwords like health care and autonomy all they like, but it doesn't make it right. It is wrong. It is wicked. It is death. The Attorney General's own FAQ published on this bill says this, it says that in a late term abortion, the baby may be induced, in which case, and I quote, it is wrapped in a blanket and the mother is given the opportunity to hold the baby as it dies. That is in the FAQ published by the AG's department in this state on this bill. And in many cases, let me tell you, that baby is not held, it dies alone. Renowned surgeon, Dr. Ben Carson says this, he says, I've had the privilege of being able to operate on babies that were 25, 26, 27, 28 weeks gestation. And I can guarantee that they can feel, they can react. You have to give them anesthesia if you're going to cut them, believe me. But they can also respond to comfort and to warmth. And for somebody to say that that's a meaningless bunch of cells, honestly, it's just totally ignorant. These are lives. And before they reach that level, at four weeks, the heart was beating. Do you know it's worth remembering that abortion stops a beating heart? This law is a law that will enable people to stop a beating heart. Now you tell me whether or not that's the ending of life. Of course it is, we know it in our very soul that it is. This child has its own DNA, its own blood type. It's not its mother, it is living within its mother. Do you know others will tell their stories, but I wanna just quote one, Lori. I read this online. She says, I'll wake up in the middle of the night. This is post-abortion grief. I'll wake up in the middle of the night thinking I hear a baby crying. I simply miss my baby. I constantly wake up wanting to nurse my child, wanting to hold my child. And that's something the doctor never told me I would experience. And I read that and I thought, of course she does. What did I say before? From the very beginning in creation, what was she called? Mother. It's what she's made, one of the things she's made to do. The pain that this lie brings about, the cost of this is unthinkable. And again, I say we are confident today when we stand here that we are here to love them both. And how much, before we clap, how much of a smaller cost is this than the cost of that lie being allowed to continue? And so we love them both. I'd like to finish by reaffirming one thing. I'd like to reaffirm that this is worth it. I would like to reaffirm that when you do love them both, when you do act at cost in the service of others, it is worth it. And it is worth it on three levels. Firstly, it's worth it on a person to person level. Do you know, even if legislation doesn't change, the very existence of a pro-life voice in any community makes a difference. We put out videos, we put out materials, we put out stuff, we say things, and I am contacted continually by people who have been changed by that material. 
And it's the same when there are pro-life ministries, when there's a pro-life voice, when there's a rally in a place like this, it makes a difference and you can make a personal difference. And I call this the quiet change because often you don't even hear about it. So never lose hope that God doesn't use the voice of truth in any community, even if it doesn't change legislation to change people and save lives, He does. It's also worth it at a political level. And I want to make this point. This abortion to birth stuff has been going around the country. Victoria, I think, was first. And that happened, and it happened with the government ramming it through. Then Queensland took place, and Queensland had some trouble. They had to do two bills, and there was a little bit of problems and trouble and all this kind of thing, and people pushing back, and they got it through. And then New South Wales happened. And what happened in New South Wales nearly broke the parliament and nearly broke the government apart. It was an incredible uprising, an incredible outpouring of concern. So much so that the government in New South Wales put legislative policy changes on the back burner after that for fear of rousing up the same community again. And here you are in South Australia. And I have to say, for a city this size to have this many people is astounding. For the government to have meant to vote on this bill this week and for some reason unknown have put it off is astounding. And for us to be sitting here saying, you know what? There could be a chance here that we could ban late-term abortion. That is not like anything that's happened in this country in any other state. So well done. It is worth it politically. But let me close on this this quote. And I quoted this last year, and this is so important for us to raise our eyes and get the big picture. It's not just worth it personally. It's not just worth it politically. It is worth it eternally. There is that quote that many of you will know from Congressman Henry Hyde, and it goes like this. I used to think it was poetry, but there's an important truth in this. He says, when the time comes, as it surely will, when we face that awesome moment, the final judgment, I've often thought, as Fulton Sheen wrote, that it is a terrible moment of loneliness. You are there alone, standing before God, and a terror will rip through your soul like nothing you can imagine. But I really think that those in the pro-life movement will not be alone. I think there'll be a chorus of voices that have never been heard in this world, but are heard beautifully and clearly in the next world. And they will plead for everyone who has been in this movement. And they will say, God, to God, spare him because he loved us. And here's the thing, again, it is to love that we are here. It is for love of them both, the children we see in our mind's eye, the women we see in our mind's eye, and yes, even the men we see in our mind's eye. It is to do the right thing. And Jesus spoke in Luke's gospel of using our earthly possessions and wealth and material things to, and I quote, make friends who will receive you into eternal dwellings. And that is what we do here today. We have friends. And I believe many of us who know Jesus will be there to see them one day. And I want to say to you, it is worth it eternally to do this. So let us love them both. Thank you.